class. The topic will be, I mean, the course we'll be discussing this morning is basic maternal and child health nursing. And this is the talk, the talk, the volume, NSC 402. Basically, we shall be discussing the abnormalities of midwifery. Remember in your last um, class, you dis we discussed NSC 409 and those topics that were discussed on that, that course are basically normal midwifery, that is normal pregnancy, normal labor, and normal puperium. But NSC 402 focuses on abnormal midwifery, or what we call complicated midwifery. And this morning, we shall be discussing five sessions, five sessions under this course. And the outline of the course is, as, as we will be discussing it as we go on, in the in the discussion now we shall be discussing multiple pregnancy hyperemesis gravidarum abruptual placenta placenta previa abortions and ectopic pregnancy now before we proceed let us start by discussing multiple pregnancy. So we shall be discussing multiple pregnancy now. Students, I'm so sorry for the itch we are experiencing. I think it will be better for us to start afresh now. Just like I said earlier, the course which we will be dealing with this morning is NST402, Basic Maternal and Child Health, Volume 3. And just like I said, this particular module deals with the abnormalities of midwifery. You know, in NST409, in our last semester, um, MCH uh, volume two, what we discussed, if you could remember vividly, is normal midwifery. We discussed normal pregnancy, normal labor, and normal puperium. But for this semester, we'll be dealing with abnormalities that are associated with pregnancy, labor, and puperium. But for this particular exam we'll be having, the outline that we will be dealing with is right there on your screen, multiple pregnancy, hyperemesis gravidarum, abruptual placenta, placenta previa, abortions, and ectopic pregnancy. Now let's kickstart by discussing multiple pregnancy. And just like I said earlier, multiple pregnancy is described as when you have one or, I mean, more, uh, more than one fetus in utero. You know, from, the, from that word, multiple, it shows that it's, it's more than one. So it can be two, we call that one twin. It can be three triplets, it can be four quadruplets and all that. And that is why some authorities call it plural pregnancy. We all know what plural is, what is more than one. So, but for the purpose of this study, we actually doing, they're dealing with twin because that one is the commonest among the multiple pregnancy, multiple pregnancy, twin pregnancy. Though in these days we have um, triplets, we have quadruplets. 
And you know the incidence, eh? twin pregnancy occurs approximately one in every hundred uh, pregnancy, while triplets occur in, I mean, one in every 8,000 to 9,000 pregnancies. And you know, just like I said, multiple pregnancies, they are, they are also proved. We have what is called uni ovula uh, pregnancy. And that uni ovula pregnancy is otherwise known as monozygotic pregnancy. And that one is when you have, when you have twin pregnancy that uh, is only, that developed from one ovum, that is just an ovum is fertilized by a spermatozoon. So we have monozygotic uh, uh, type of multiple pregnancy in that situation. But for the dizygotic pregnancy or dizygotic twins, which is also called bi, binovular, you know, anything that is bi refers to two. In that situation, the fertilization, there are two ovum, or let me say two ova that were fertilized by two spermatozoa. And in this situation, dizygotic twins are more common than monozygotic twins. Now, there are a way to differentiate this type of twin as in monozygotic twin and dizygotic twin. Just like I had mentioned earlier, for monozygotic twin, you know, it is um, a novum is fertilized, and eventually, it, it, during the process of a uh, cell division, there will be two two different uh, two different uh, um, embryo will develop from that fertilization. Unlike that zygotic twin, where you have two different ova fertilized by two different spermatozoa. And what is the another difference between these two categories of twins is that for monozygotic twins, they have only one placenta. That is the twins, they share the same placenta. While in dizygotic twins, the twins share, I mean, they have two different placenta. Though they may be fused, but there are two different placenta. And you know, the difference, another uh, difference is most often than none for monozygotic twins, they are always of the same sex. That is, they can be male, male or female, female. But that is zygotic twin, most often than none, they are of different sexes. That is, a male and a female. You know, how is multiple pregnancy diagnosed? How is multiple pregnancy diagnosed? Definitely, I mean, really, it may be difficult to diagnose, but there are things as to diagnose without using ultrasound and the likes. But you know, you remember during antenatal history, you will have taken history about the patient, the patient background, and from that family history, you know, it will have been said that, okay, in my, in my own family, uh, we have history of twinning. As a matter of fact, the, the client can even say she's a twin, or the husband is a twin, or the, more, the parent has given birth to, to uh, a set of twins before. So that one will trigger your suspicion that the pregnancy this individual is carrying may be multiple. But all those ones, they are just, they are not um, enough uh, evidence, or they are not enough tools to say, okay, this pregnancy is twin. Well, it's multiple, let me say multiple. But you can and make a definitive diagnosis by using ultrasound. So I know on that ultrasound, if the pregnancy is still in maybe the first trimester or early sizes, two gestational sac can be viewed on ultrasound. And you know, as the pregnancy is advancing, you know, it will be very, very clear on ultrasound that the pregnancy in the, in, in the in, in utero of that individual is more than one. Or let me say the, the fetuses 
is more than one. And there are other ways you can also diagnose without the use of ultrasound. During abdominal examination, you know, abdominal examination involves your inspection, your palpation. I know the palpation can be lateral, and um, you can have your lateral palpation and your pelvic palpation. So while you are doing your abdominal examination, you can detect or you can make a guess that, no, what I'm palpating here is more than one. But just like I said earlier, the definitive diagnosis is using ultrasound. So during your abdominal uh, palpation, during, uh, I mean, during your abdominal examination, you know, on inspection, the abdomen may, will be bigger than the gestational age. I'm sure you know what that one means. If the abdomen, you know, just inspecting the, the, the abdomen, you discovered, okay, you, you've already known the LMP of that woman, and you know, the woman said, okay, from your own calculation, the pregnancy is about eight weeks, and the abdomen is growing to like 10 weeks, 12 weeks. Then you begin to think of multiple pregnancy until otherwise uh, stated. Then for your auscultation, I'm sure you know what auscultation means. You listen to the fetal heart of or the, the fetus in utero. Though auscultation may not be diagnostic enough, but what you see is that for you to, to begin to think that the pregnancy is uh, multiple, one, you will, you will be listening to two different heartbeats. <coughs> Sorry. You'll be listening to two different heartbeats. And for you to conclude, that the heartbeats are actually two. You will listen to the two, and the difference between the two heartbeats must be more than 10 beats per minute. So you know that one will also raise your suspicion of multiple pregnancy. And just like I said, all those ones that are that may be other differential diagnosis, that may be other things that may mimic those um those um uh, things you have seen. So ultrasound will be the best tool to make a definitive uh, diagnosis. Now, now that you have known how to diagnose multiple pregnancy, definitely for a single, single pregnancy, it comes with its own effect. Remember, and I know I taught you, the um, effect of pregnancy, effect of, of, of pregnancy on the woman, effect of woman, I mean, effect of pregnancy, the body on the, on the pregnancy, and vice versa. No, now that the woman is carrying multiple pregnancy, I am sure that you begin to know or to think that there are things that will be expected and the normal effect of pregnancy may be exaggerated. And that is that one will lead us to exacerbation of minor disorder. You know, normally for the minor disorders of pregnancy, we have nausea, vomiting, money sickness, and the likes. But for twin pregnancy, the effect of the nausea, money sickness, and the other uh, minor disorders will be ex exacerbated. That is, it will it, 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 it tend to be more pronounced. Then there will be anemia. I know that anemia may be uh, iron deficiency or folic acid deficiency. And there may be pregnancy induced hypertension. So, you know, normally, or let me say, we like to say normally, or for minor disorders of pregnancy, you know, the, the pregnancy have effect on every organ and every structure in the human body. So, but for this one now, preg pregnancy in this hypertension may be associated with large placenta sites and increased hormonal output. Then there will be polyhydraminose. I'm sure you know what polyhydraminose is, but 
for me to refresh your memory, you know, in utero, when the pregnancy is still in, when the fetus is in, in, in utero, amniotic fluid is the water, would I say water, through which the baby swims and change position. And normally, if the amniotic fluid is produced more than normal, we call it polyhydraminous. And if it is less than the usual thing, I know you know that one is soluble hydraminous. But <clears throat> in, in, in case of multiple pregnancy, you know, there will be there may be increased production of amniotic fluid leading to polyhydraminous. Then prior symptoms, the patient or the pregnant woman may have uh, oedema, varicose, I mean, varicose vein, and the legs. And other things are the, 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 the woman, <clears throat> we have a dyspnea. That is difficulty in breathing. I'm sure you know what accounts for that. The uterus, which is pelvic organ before pregnancy setting, is coming out of the pelvis and coming to the abdomen to become abdominal organ, now pushing or pushing prayer on the respiratory organs, especially the diaphragm. So that's what we, we account for the dyspnea the patient may be having. Now you know the effects, you know how it's diagnosed. So how is the multiple, how is it managed? That is how is multiple pregnancy managed? The first thing is that early diagnosis is very, very, very important. You know, when the diagnosis is made early, you begin to, to you begin to uh, watch the woman critically. And in that wise, some minor disorders can even pre be prevented from setting in. Disorders like uh, folic acid, iron deficiency, anemia, will be prevented from setting in. And in that wise, hemoglobin level will be maintained as normal throughout the period of a pregnancy. And that is the reason every pregnant woman should be encouraged to book for antenatal care as early as possible, especially when the woman misses her period. Now, if the patient comes to the antenatal clinic as scheduled, you know, you examine, she presents a complaint and you treat accordingly. And there are, there are cases where that woman will have to be admitted. For example, if a patient has pregnancy in this hypertension that cannot be controlled on outpatient basis, that patient has to be admitted. Remember, we are, we are dealing with many lives here, the life of the woman herself, the life of the fetuses, more than one fetus here. So critical, critical attention has to be given to that woman. And admission may be offered to relieve discomfort of pregnancy, especially as the pregnancy is um, as the pregnancy is advancing. Now, the woman has carried the pregnancy to um, has carried the pregnancy to term. Though let me let me let me say it here that most <clears throat> most multiple pregnancies are not always being carried to term because. By that time, the, 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 the muscular layer of the, the uterus will have been overstretched. And you know, the nature has a way of saying, if this thing is overstretched and the communication with the brain and labor may set in, what I'm just trying to say is that labor may set in before the pregnancy reaches a term. And one of the reasons attention must be paid to a woman with multiple pregnancy. Now let's assume the, the pregnancy has been carried to term or labor set in. Then you begin to think of how to manage such labor. <clears throat> and remember the, remember the stages of labor. So for the first stage of labor, you begin to prepare that you want to receive two fetuses, two uh, babies. And you also think 
that the baby might be premature because in a situation when that pregnancy is not carried to time, so the babies may be delivered prematurely. By now, we'll be calling those fetuses neonates. So you make preparation for two neonates. And during that labor, you monitor closely fetal maternal well being. You monitor closely any slight deviation from normal, especially the fetal. The, 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 the fetal uh, monitoring, the, the fetal heart rate and the likes, you begin to think of emergency cesarean section to expedite uh, labor so that you have a woman who is alive and the babies will, will also be alive. And one of the reasons, when that woman comes in labor, you notify, the operating theater, the obstetrician, the uh, neonatal units, some people call it special care baby units. So those ones are notified so that they can be at alert for any eventuality that may happen. In a special care baby units, where some people call neonatal units, you make, you prepare two incubators ready to receive the neonates. I you know when when for the first stage, I mean, for the first stage of labor progresses normally. You know, first stage of labor terminates at the full dilatation of the cervical os. Then the patient is moved to the second stage of labor. Just like I said, the obstetrician is in a, is already in a, uh, is already in attendance. The anesthetists are there. The pediatrician are there. Just in case there is any complication. And you know, normally the babies are delivered, the first baby first, the leading baby rather, the, the leading baby comes, most of the time the leading, the leading baby comes uh, presenting the, 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 the head. And you know, after delivering the first baby, you quickly examine so that you know the position, the lie of the second baby. And you know, gentle manipulation can be made so that the second baby can be delivered with, with, with no complication. And remember that when those babies are delivered, they need to be, identi to be identified by putting bracelets depending on, the, 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 or depending on each facility. But the, 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 the short thing is that the babies more, they must be identified. The leading twin, who is the first uh, twin, must be labeled the time of delivery. I'm sure you all know the time of delivery, the ABGA scoring, and all that will be, will be noted. Then the second um, baby also, the second thing after delivery, the time of delivery, the, you know, remember that we need to resuscitate these babies, and you know, that is why pediatricians are in attendance so that with the midwife they will be able to resuscitate the baby, take note of the abdomen scoring, and you know the baby is well wrapped and taken to the um, neonatal unit or special care baby units. Remember that the baby, we actually discussing multiple pregnancy, but there's no how you discuss pregnancy without mentioning the baby, especially in labor. So remember the baby has to be examined too, you examine the baby for congenital abnormalities, which may be common with twin or with multiple pregnancy, and every detail must be documented. Now, how do you uh, manage the third stage of labor? You know, you actually monitor it as um, normal, as usual. For <clears throat> baby, especially the diastigotic twin that I already said earlier that they may have two placenta. So you make sure that the placenta if it is a single placenta is delivered, then if there are two placenta, they are delivered. And you know, oxytocin drug can be can be used to to augment the contraction at this point in time. You ensure that the placenta is completely delivered with no residue in utero because any slight uh, retained products 
can cause problems, especially bleeding problem, postpartum bleeding. So you ensure the placenta, if it is one, is completely delivered. If there are two, they are completely delivered. How, are, how will you ensure that they are complete? You know, you need to examine. And that is why just a single midwife cannot be in labor room to take delivery of even a single pregnancy, not to talk of, um, not to talk of a multiple pregnancy, a pregnant woman in labor. So the placenta is, is, is examined for completeness, is examined for you know the, the the membrane they are examined so that you know and i'm sure you remember how placenta is being examined it's examined under running water you take you take note of the cord remember the cord there should be two i mean three vessels uh, on in the on the umbilical cord <clears throat> the three vessels and you ensure that those three vessels are there you know remember that if there is an absence of a vessel, it may indicate that a patient, that baby might be having renal conditions. So one of the reasons why you should actually examine so that you know what you are dealing with. Now, the, the babies had been delivered, you had actually taken care of the woman, you rubbed the uterus so that every other product of conception can be evacuated with no retained products and the baby the woman will also be transferred to the lying world depending on the organization of the facility and you know monitoring you keep on monitoring the the, the, the woman what are the complications that are associated with multiple pregnancies that may be delay in the birth of the second twin that may be locked twins and generally what are the complications associated with a multiple pregnancy, you know, abortion is one of the complications, polyadaminous, just like I said, there may be fetal abnormalities, then there may be malpresentation. You know, just like, just like I said earlier, most of the time the leading twin may present with the head, but most often than non bridge presentation is almost so there's malpresentation, then there may be premature rupture of membrane. Those, these are, complications associated with multiple pregnancy. There may be pro prolonged labor, and you know, just like I said earlier, also there may be locked twins and postpartum hemorrhage. You know, postpartum hemorrhage, the placenta site, if it is a single placenta, it may be so large. And even if it is, if there are two placenta, you know, there, there will be two different sites for that placenta implantation. And one of the reasons, if care is not taken, the woman may bleed postpartumly. And that one has brought us to the end of our discussion of, on um, multiple pregnancy. Let us move on to hyperemesis gravidarium. Hyperemesis gravidarium. Now, what is hyperemesis gravidarium? Hyperemesis gravidarium is an uncontrolled vomiting during pregnancy that results in dehydration weight loss and ketosis. You know, I said it's uncontrolled because normally, if I, are, if I am not confusing you, one of the minor disorders of pregnancy is vomiting, nausea and vomiting. So to a greater extent, we can say that not a vomiting during pregnancy may be may be normal if I put it, if I want to put it like that, quote and unquote, because it is minor with time it can go. But with epiremesis gravidarium, this one is uncontrolled. And it will be associated with dehydration, weight loss, and ketosis. So when dehydration, weight loss, and ketosis occurs, then you think of hyperemesis gravidarium. From the name, you know anything hyper, is above normal, then MSS is vomiting. So above normal pregnant, above normal vomiting in pregnancy, if I may put it like that for especially for those of you who are not midwives. Now, just like I said, most of the time pregnancies occur, I mean occur with a I mean, there are occasions when um, patients or when pregnant women vomit during pregnancy. And what is actually the cause of a pregnancy, I mean, hyperemesis, a gravidarum? 
the the the, the cause is, is not unconnected with high level of estrogen and uma coronic gonadotrophic hormone (ACG). And funny things are from researches. It has been observed that less than three percent of women of pregnant uh, of pregnant women we have hyperemesis gravidarum, and not this. Most of the time, it happens. It occurs between the fourth and sixth week of uh, pregnancy. That is, it begins like the fourth week to the seventh, I mean, to the sixth week, and you know it grows worse around nine to ten. 13 weeks. What are the causes of hyperemesis gravidarum? The exact cause is unknown. And somebody will say it's idiopathic. Or, like I said earlier, the increased level of estrogen and SCG has been implicated in development of hyperemesis gravidarum. But there are other disease conditions that have also been associated with aparemesis gravidarum. And one of such is multiple pregnancy, which we have just discussed. You know, I had said it with multiple pregnancy that there will be exacerbation of um, minor disorders of pregnancy. So that is the reason why multiple pregnancy, why with multiple pregnancy, the woman we have the hyperemesis gravidarium. Either the different mole is another uh, is another disease condition that has been associated with um, hyperemesis gravidarium. Another thing is history of unsuccessful pregnancies. Now, what are the clinical features, and how is the hyperemesis gravidarium um, diagnosed? You know, the basic feature of uh, hyperemesis gravidarum, the basic clinical feature is uncontrolled vomiting. Uncontrolled vomiting. And it does not, it is not associated with a particular time of the day. You know, for normal nausea and vomiting, people call it morning sickness because the pregnant woman would, would wake up in the morning and begin to, and begin to, 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 to throw up, to vomit. But with hyperemesis gravidarum, it's not associated with any time of the day. It can occur in the morning, in the afternoon, any time of the day. <clears throat> and other things that can actually make you to begin to think, okay, this woman may be having it, is that it is associated with dehydration and there is electrolyte derangement. There is electrolyte derangement. You know, for a woman to lose more than five percent of her normal weight before pregnancy, then it has become hyperemesis gravidarium. You know, because of dehydration, there will be decrease in urine output. So one will begin to think of renal involvement if care is not taken, and you know, headache, confusion. You know, when there is decrease in urine output. Then the neurological uh, symptoms will begin to come in. The woman will be confused. There may be fainting attack, and the woman will also may be jaundiced. Then other other features, other manifestations are dry or inelastic skin. You know that one is associated with dehydration. Then the woman, the woman's, the woman's weight is less than expected for the gestational age. Remember, the normal weight gain during pregnancy. I know when you know the baseline of the, the base, the baseline weight of you of that woman. Then, when you now weigh this woman, I begin to think instead of the woman to be gaining weight, the one is losing weight. You no know, problem is is looming. Then the post rates will be weak. Um, it will be rapid. The blood, pressure, the blood pressure will be low. You know, all these ones, they are signs and symptoms of uh, dehydration, which may lead to shock. And, you know, with, with the hypovolemic shock, the, the, there will be the urine. If you do urine analysis, the, the urine, we have acetone smell. It will be scanty. You know, there is 
that we will be pulling urea and it will be dark in, 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 in color because of the hydration it will be concentrated. What are the, the investigations that will actually make you to know that the woman is having hyperemesis complications of a uh, hyperemesis that they or to rule out complication, let me put it that way. The investigations the, that will be carried out on the woman so that you will know that the woman is not having complication. You do serum calcium, um, uh, so you, you take the level of serum calcium to rule, to rule out a hyperparathyroidism, then you do liver function test. You know, when you do that, one, that one serves as baseline data, full blood count, thyroid function test, they serve as baseline data in which you would compare subsequent results with. You know, I told you it's uncontrollable. The, 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 the vomiting we, we go on like that, especially if the patient did not seek uh, medical help on time. So when the patient comes in, you do all these ones to you do, you do all these ones to know the baseline data so that you can compare subsequent uh, results with them so you be able to know the appropriate uh, action to be taken. Pelvic ultrasound is done to rule out if the woman is not carrying a uh, fetus that are, that are malfunction, um, that are uh, features that uh, are malformed, that are malformed. Then you, you one of the investigation is to do, to take the weight of that woman. You know, I told you, if that woman has lost 5% of pre-pregnancy state, then there is a problem. Now, in all this, you need to know some differential diagnosis. What, what do I mean by differential diagnosis? There are, there are disease conditions that may mimic a hyperemesis gravidarium, especially the gastrointestinal disease condition. You know, with gastrointestinal disease condition, most of the time they come with vomiting. And if care is not taken, when that patient comes in with gastrointestinal um, condition, symptoms, you need to rule out. And one of those things is to take your history. Where history taking is very, very important. At least with hyperemesis gravidarium, you must, the first thing you do is to be sure there is pregnancy. At least with pregnancy, you can now begin to do some other things. But you know, gastroenteritis, hepatitis, appendicitis, they all have uh, vomiting as their symptoms and you need to rule out that the patient is not having all these ones so as to make a definitive uh, diagnosis. Then, how is it managed? You know, if it is mild, the patient can be managed on outpatient basis. And that is why if the patient can still tolerate a little, the patient can be given oral drugs, but in severe cases, in severe cases, the patient will be admitted. The patient will be admitted, and the pharmacologic therapy, that is the medication, you have your vitamin B, you have your doxylamine, all these ones, they are form of vitamins. I know tamine, uh, vitamin B1 has been implicated. Deficiency of uh, Vitamin B1 has been implicated in the um, in, uh, occurrence of a hyperemesis gravidarium. And one of the reasons you must, uh, you must ensure that even pre-pregnancy, pre the patients are given. And you will still remember, you know, I always discuss about preconceptual counseling. These are the things the patient who should have been educated on before even getting pregnant. Well, that is not where we are going. We are discussing the pharmacologic therapy of the hyperemesis gravidarium. Other drugs that can be used are methylchromide. The dosage are in your course material that can go through a prometacin, though not, not readily used again, but these are the drugs that can be, can be used. On that stone can also be used if, you know, this one can be used if the patient is tending towards any complication. And, you know, uh, when encephalopathy is one of 
the complication that that patient may have if the patient is not having a prompt attention. Now this one has to do with the neurological dysfunction in which the patient will have ataxia, the patient will have some olfactory, olfactory um, condition, issues with the eye, the patient will not be no blood vision and all that. And it is very, very important you don't take hyperemesis gravidarium lightly. So the patients, you know, especially with that persistent, persistent vomiting, the fluid has to be replaced. So you replace the, the, the lost fluid by giving appropriate intravenous uh, fluid. So, and just like I, I, I put here, that when I administer IV fluid to a patient with uh, hyperemesis gravidarium, you prevent this syndrome by avoiding intravenous glucose until timing has been administered. So if, if you don't want uh, Winnikin encephalopathy to develop, you administer timing, that is vitamin B1, before you give intravenous glucose, intravenous glucose in form of 5% uh, uh, glucose, 10% glucose, and the likes. You know, you know, for a patient who is not tolerating orally at all, you know, who in fluid, when you are giving your fluid resuscitation, you know, glucose is one of the, the fluid that you want to give so that the patient can have energy, uh, can have energy. But uh, I'm trying to tell you now that you administer timing is administered before you give um you give your uh, your IV fluid. Uh, that is uh, glucose based, so that you, the patient will not develop this uh, uh, encephalopathy, the syndrome I'm talking about, the Wernicke uh, syndrome. Then, with persistent dehydration, if persistent dehydration occur, then you begin to think of giving um, nutrition uh, parenterally, either through the, uh, you give maybe through NG tube and, you know, Energy to be can be passed to give more than you can give with fluid, but this one is actually on very rare occasion, not really uh, what we come with or what we see in our day to day practice. So, part of the management you manage the dietary intake of that patient, you know, with your fluid resuscitation, the pharmacological pharmacological uh, management, you will know that the patient need, there should be improvements in the patient's condition. And by this time, you begin to allow the patient to eat small frequent meal, small, a small frequent meal. The, you avoid fatty and spicy food. You know, they are hematogenic. They can, you know, other normal condition for some people when they eat fatty food, they begin to have nausea as if they want to vomit. So for this one, you avoid for you avoid um you avoid the uh, fatty food, you avoid spicy food, then you increase intake of bland diet. I'm sure you know what bland diet is, the food that is not spicy there. You give high protein snacks, then you give a uh, cracker. Uh, cracker biscuit is um, also advised to be given to the patients, and that one has brought us to the uh, brought us to the end of our discussion on um, hyperemesis abruptio placenta. Um, what is abruptio placenta? You know, interchangeably, some people call it placenta abruptio, some people call it abruptio placenta. It is actually being used changeably. But the meaning is that there is a premature separation of a normally infected placenta. And it's usually occur after 20 weeks of gestation. So please take note of the definition. The placenta is implanted normally. It is normally implanted. You know where placenta should be implanted? It can be implanted as the posterior or the anterior fundus of the uterus. So I'm sure you remember your anatomy and physiology of the uterus. Let me quickly mention this, that as we are discussing all these abnormalities of midwifery, remember your anatomy and 
physiology of the reproductive system. Because there's no how you would discuss this one without making reference to your anatomy and physiology of a, a reproductive system. The reason is this, those ones are the normal physiology and you can actually appreciate abnormality when you know the normal thing. Now I told you for abruption placenta or placenta abruption is pre premature separation of a normally implanted placenta. So you begin to think where should placenta be implanted? So when you know where placenta should be implanted, then you can now say this is abnormally implanted. Now, let's quickly rush as we go to the types of placenta. You had already known, uh, you had already known the, 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 the definition. Now, the types of uh, abruptual placenta, it depends on the way you want to classify it. Some authorities classify it as mild, moderate, and severe. And that one actually has to do with the severity. So if it is mild, if it is mild, you know, when something is mild, it, 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 the fetus is still viable, moderate, you know, with a placenta abruptio, one of the, the signs you will see is that there'll be vaginal bleeding. So with a moderate um, type, the bleeding will not be much, but with severe type of uh, abruptio, that will, the bleeding will be more. Now, uh, medically, let me say you can classify it as concealed, revealed, and a mixed hemorrhage. And that classification is actually based on the, 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 the bleeding, the amount of bleeding the woman has her vagina. And for concealed bleeding, you know, from that word concealed, the woman will be bleeding internally. The bleeding will be concealed. The hemorrhage will not be visible through the vagina, and you know the bleeding can be uh, the bleeding can be uh, retro placenta. It can be behind the placenta, but there is bleeding that is concealed. But for that of reveal, you know, as the name implies, you see the bleeding coming out per vagina, and for that one you can actually quantify. The the, the 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 volume of blood loss, but the third one is um mixed uh, bleeding or mixed hemorrhage. For mixed, there is concealed, there is um revealed. You now begin to think why conceal reveal? The bleeding, the placenta is separating. Some blood are retained in while some are coming out that is mixed so for every bleeding for every bleeding per vaginum it has to be taken with all seriousness because you want to see if the the, the life of the fetus in utero can still be 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 be, be uh, controls the baby will not die the, the fetus will not die in utero what are the risk factors risk factors for uh, abruptio placenta. We have older maternal age, maternal age over 35 years is uh, a risk factor. We have hypertension, pregnancy induced hypertension is another risk factor for abruptio placenta. Then anything that has to do with, um, that has to do with the normal function of the placenta. It's, and that on anything that, that reduces the, blood, the normal blood flow, to the placenta may cause the placenta to separate. And that is what we have with the placenta ischemia. If there's any reduced blood flow to the placenta, the, the, the placenta may begin to separate, even when it is normally implanted. Another thing is a polyhydraminous intramenotic infection. Those are the, 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 the risk factors to developing or to having a bronchial placenta. Signs and symptoms, and how they can be, how it can be um, diagnosed. Just like I said, per vagina bleeding. So when you see that the patient is bleeding per vagina, you now begin to think, what is, how, how is the bleeding? Is it bright? Is it dark red? I'm, I talk, I'm talking about the blood. Is it revealed? You know, for I mean, 
for vaginal bleeding, that one, for you to know if the, if the bleeding is, I mean, if the blood is bright or dark red in color, it has to be reviewed with a concealed, you can't do that one. So as separation continues, the uterus may begin to be, you know, the woman will be having pain, especially on abdominal palpation. So when you touch the abdomen, it will be painful, it will be tender, and the woman will be irritable. The woman will be irritable. I, I think you are taking notes of the, the distinct um, signs and symptoms of a, of a abruption placenta. Then, you know, there is, there is um, bleeding. So the patient may have hemorrhagic shock. The patient may have shock, and in this wise, it is a hemorrhagic shock because it is the low level of blood in the system that is causing the shock. Unlike the hyperemesis gravidinum that we have discussed earlier, for hyperemesis gravidinum we discussed earlier, what we call, we call the shock of that one is a hypovolemic because that one is reduction in the uh, fluid volume. But for placenta abruption, it is a hemorrhagic uh, shock and you know, there may be signs and symptoms of a, a disseminated intravascular coagulation if from action is not taken. Then how is um, diagnosis made? You begin to think of a abruption placenta if the woman has vaginal bleeding. Either it is painful or painless. You begin to think of um, you begin to think of a abruption placenta. Then you try pain and tenderness. You think of abruption placenta, fetal distress, or even the fetal may be even dead. That is how you see the intrauterine you trying um, death. So the hemorrhagic shock, just like I said, DIC, all this one will be pointers to the patient to the fact that the patient may have them. Abruptual placenta. The management of abruptual placenta, the patient has to be admitted. And when the patient is admitted, first thing, there is, there is, a, uh, there is hemorrhage. So the patient may be, will be in shock. So you have, you gain IV access, you begin to, to, to you, when you gain IV access, that is, you set IV line, you begin to give fluid to especially plasma expander. Before you do your uh, full blood counts, you do the PCV. If the if the, the, the patient is having anemia, you know you make provision for a blood transfusion. Then you begin to to think about the way to alleviate pain. You know, I told you the patient may have pain. Then you, you monitor fetal maternal well-being closely so that you know that the patient is still viable. It is very very important. You monitor fetal maternal well-being, the vital signs of the patient. Then you monitor uh, urine output so that you'll be sure that the patient is not having any renal complication. Then remember that your intake and output record must be kept so that you know uh, you know the degree of a complication that is set in. So what are the complications that will set in when the patient has a blood placenta? When a woman in, in, in a, a woman that is pregnant has Abruptual placenta, there may be coagulation defect. That is why I was emphasizing simulated intravascular coagulation. There may be renal failure, there may be postpartum hemorrhage, then intrauterine fetal death may be, may be a com complication. And if care is not take, taken, especially if the patients did not present earlier, even maternal death is one of the complications that may arise. Now, let's quickly move to our discussion on a placenta previa, placenta previa. For a number of people, they are always confused uh, difference between placenta previa and uh, placenta abruption. Really, the two has to go with placenta. But for one, placenta is normally situated, it begins to detach. But for this one, we want to talk about the placenta is not normally situated. The placenta is not normally situated. So instead of the placenta to be situated at the, to be situated at the, the fonder aspect of the uterus, either the anterior or the posterior uh, aspect of the fundus, this one is partially or 
wholly implanted in the lower uterine segments. Mm -hmm. I hope you are getting me. Well, so the placenta is, uh, is not situated normally, and that is what informs the detachments that may occur later as the pregnancy occurs. Now, I'm sure you get to see the screen, okay? What you're having on your screen now, the first, uh, the first baby you are seeing on that screen, the nose that the placenta is normally situated, look at the position of that placenta on at the fonder area of the uterus. But the lower picture you are seeing, you can see that it is the head that is at the fonder area of the uterus where placenta need to be normally situated. And now look downward. You will now see that placenta situated at the lower segment of, 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 um, of the uterus. And even from this picture, it is not clear that with placenta previa, there, there is every tendency that there's mal presentation, there's mal positioning. From the, the lower picture now, you can see that the presentation is breached because it is the Botox that the, the baby is presenting with. And the, the, the head, which is supposed to be the normal presenting part, is at the upper part of the um, uterine of the uterine wall. Now you have known what placenta previa means, what it is, what are the risk factors to developing placenta previa in a pregnant woman. One of the factors is multiparity. Multiparity, if that patient has given birth to uh, babies uh, more than four times, there's every tendency that the placenta is implanted at any available site or in the uterus because uh, there is always a placenta site, you know, if the placenta, if the uterus has accommodated, accommodated so many placentas, so the placenta can decide to, impl uh, to implant anywhere that is favorable for, for it. Then previous, previous uh, cesarean delivery, you know, with cesarean delivery, there is scar. So it's, it's also a risk factor. Well, get me right anyway. I am not saying multiparity with every multi, uh, every multiparous woman, uh, the woman will have placenta previa. I am not saying with every previous cesarean section, the woman will have um, placenta previa. What I am saying is that these are the factors that may prone the woman to having a uh, placenta implanted in the lower uterine segment. Then, placenta, other uterine abnormalities that inhibit normal implantation of the placenta is also, uh, there are also risk factors to having placenta previa like fibroid. Normally, a woman can be pregnant and that pregnancy will be called, the fetus will be coexisting with a fibroid. So if the fibroid is, is, at, the, is the, at, at the fonder part of the uterus, so the placenta may not have chance to be implanted at that, uh, at that part. And it will look, you know, it's nature. The nature will just look for a way that is favorable for implantation. Then smoking has been implicated. Multifeta pregnancy, like a multi pregnancy, is also a factor. Then older maternal age, any maternal age over 35 years, there are risk factors. Let's quickly discuss the types of um, placenta previa. Um, we have type one, and we call it low line, low line placenta previa. So the majority of the placenta is at the upper segment with just little encroaching to the lower segments. And the yeah, cervical os, the internal cervical os is not occluded. Look at that picture on your screen very well. You can see that the placenta is not implanted on in the, the, the in the anterior in the fonda area. It's in, it is I mean it is implanted 
at the lower segment. But if you look at that picture very well, the internal cervical os is not occluded. Now, uh, for uh, placenta previa type two, that one is called marginal placenta previa. Take note of the alternate names for this type. You know, I told you type one is a low line placenta. Type one is low line placenta. Type two is a marginal, uh, marginal placenta previa, marginal placenta previa. And this one, it is, you know, the, 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 the placenta is partially located in the lower segment near the internal os but the internal os is not occluded i think you can you can you can check it on your screen very well the internal os the internal cervical os is not occluded but it's and it almost encroaches to it but it's not occluded and that is why it is called marginal type 2 placenta previa now let me say that with type 1 placenta previa, with type 1 placenta previa, vaginal delivery is possible. Then the blood loss is usually mild. Then the mother and the, and the fetus, they are at least stable. But with marginal, with marginal uh, placenta previa, that is type 2 placenta previa, vaginal delivery may be possible, particularly if the placenta is implanted and seriously. Vaginal delivery is, is is possible. Blood loss is moderate. The though fetal hypoxia is most likely, and one of the reasons why fetal maternal well-being should be closely monitored. Let's go to placenta previa type three. That type three is otherwise known as incomplete or partial centra incomplete or partial central. Why is it called that? It is central, it, it is centrally located on the internal, over the internal cervical os, but it does not cover it completely. It does not cover it completely. See, get this, get this uh, explanation very well. Type three is incomplete or partial central. No, we call it partial central that is already at the cent central, but it does not completely occlude the internal cervical os. But what we now make it to occlude it is when dilatation of the cervix begins. Then it begins to occlude the, the, the cervical os. With it, bleeding is likely to be severe, especially in late pregnancy. You know, in late pregnancy, in late pregnancy, the body by the nation begin to get prepared for labor. The, 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 the body will begin to get prepared for labor. And the, 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 that, that period, the service, the, the service will begin to thin. You know, you remember your effacement, cervical effacement, and all that. The, the service will begin to, to thin out. And as the service begins to thin out, that, that placenta that is Partially central will begin to encroach into the into the cervix and the bleeding may be severe. Uh, spontaneous vaginal delivery is inappropriate, so the patient should be prepared for cesarean section. So SVD is not appropriate in this case. Now let's move to type four. That one is total. You know we said type three is complete. So we can even say this one is complete, or we call it total, and it is called central. Look at that uh, picture on your screen. The placenta totally occlude the cervical internal os. The cervical internal os is totally occluded. It's totally occluded, and hemorrhage is inevitable here. But vaginal bleeding is inevitable. So. With this, I'm sure you should be able to discuss its types of placenta previa with relevant um, details. Detail. Now, the clinical manifestation. One, it is sudden. Let me quickly say this. For abruptio placenta, it may be chronic, especially with uh, 
is the uh, placenta ischemia if the if the blood supply to the um, to the uh, to the placenta is reduced so that separation of um, abruptio may be chronic but with placenta previa it is sudden it is acute in onset it is painless for abruptio it is painful for placenta it is painless and this one is unrelated with activities for abruptio even trauma to the abdomen can cause abruptio placenta but this one is the bleeding is unrelated to any activity and the, the, the bleeding is revealed you know with abruptio you have revealed concealed mix but with this one the bleeding is revealed you know i am emphasizing this emphasizing this one so that you'll be able to know the difference between abruptio and um, placenta previa so the, the the bleeding is bright red and it's a uh, dark in color so with a uh, abdominal examination the abdomen, the abdomen is soft, or the patient, the abdomen is soft and relaxed, the uterus is relaxed. You know, with that, with abruptio, the, abdo, the abdomen is tender. It is tender. This one is soft and the uh, uterus is relaxed. So the fetal head remains unengaged in contrast to the period of gestation. The fetal head will be unengaged. Why is fetal head unengaged? The placenta is including the lower uterine segments where the fetal head should engage to. Then the fetal heart sound is usually present here. It's usually present, especially when the patient presents very early. There is mal presentation. I have told you why that one is uh, is possible. So mal presentation, mal positioning. Even with um, uh, with multi gravida, the light is usually unstable. The lie is usually unstable. Then, the management of a placenta um, previa, you have your expectant, expectant management and your active management. Expectant in the sense that if, especially with type one and type two um, placenta uh, previa, and the, 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 the pregnancy is not term, you can give conservative management. The patients will be admitted to the O and G ward, and the patient, the fetal maternal well-being is closely monitored. And you know the investigations, uh, hemodynamic, uh, full blood counts, renal function, and all that is monitored. Ultrasound is done, and you can with type one and type two, you can stick monitor the patient to near term or term before uh, delivery can be uh, initiated or before labor setting but for active management for active management regardless of the gestational age it shows that an action has to be taken to save the life of the the, the, the mother or the fetus or both of them together. You know, I said and or if the if the fetus is not viable again, then you focus on the mother to save the life of the mother. But if the fetus is viable, you begin to see how the life of both the fetus and the mother will be saved. So active management also requires admission. And with, with active management, with active management, emergency cesarean section can be a solution especially with type 3 and type 4 placenta previa other details can be seen in your in, in your manual now let's quickly move to another abnormality of midwifery and it is abortion i'm sure that abortion is very common even for somebody who is not a medical practitioner yeah, abortion, you hear abortion, abortion, abortion. What is abortion? Abortion is termination of pregnancy or expulsion, expulsion of the fetus before viability. I'm sure you got that one very well. Termination of pregnancy or expulsion of pregnancy before 
viability. I use the word termination because it can be spontaneous or it can be induced. What do we mean by spontaneous? Spontaneous is that no action was taken. The pregnancy just, <laughs> let, me, let me say it like Yoruba will say, the pregnancy just came down. But for induced, an action is taken. An action is taken. Either the action is um, legal or illegal. An action is taken. So that is why that name induced, induced. It shows that it is not natural. An action was taken before viability. Now, how do we define uh, viability of a pregnancy? You know, we, divide, we define viability considering two factors. You consider the gestational age, or you, con you consider the fetal weight. Those are the two factors that you can use to determine viability. In developed country, their own viability is before 28 weeks, or if the, if the fetal is less than one kg, 1,000 gram. But in, in developing country like ours, the viability is before 20 weeks, and the fetus is less than 500 grams, 0.5 kg. So what are the causes or the factors that may be responsible for abortion? We have like three basic causes. We have overfitter, we have maternal causes, and we have the paternal causes. Now, talking about overfitter, from that word, it, 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 it has something to, with, to do with the ovum. Remember, the ovum is the woman, is, is that um, is what the spermatozoa we, we join together for, fertil for fertilization to take place. So we call it overfitter, overfitter um, cause because the cause of that abortion has to do with the ovum or with the fetus in utero. And most of the time, chromosomal abnormalities is a factor that will cause abortion in that son. Then poor implantation, poor implantation, I am talking about the embeddiment of the fertilized ovum. If the ovum, fertilized ovum, the zygote, if it's not embedded, if it is not implanted very well on the uterus, it, there may be abortion. So that is, those are the, the, the factors on the overfitter. And get this one right. This one, this factor tends to occur between zero to 10 weeks of gestation. Overfitter abortion tends to occur between zero to 10 weeks of gestation. Now, maternal factor. Maternal factor tends to occur between 11 and 19 weeks of gestation. And in this, in this situation, diseases of the, of, the, of the woman either acquire disease or chronic disease interferes with placenta oxygenation. And in this wise, abortion may occur. I said um, acquired or chronic. Chronic disease conditions such as diabetes mellitus, hypertension, those are the chronic medical conditions that may lead to abortion. But for acquired um, condition, you know, rubella, in, uh, if a woman is uh, pregnant, and, I, and now exposed to rubella, I will still have to draw you back to your preconceptual counseling. Remember that during agree your preconceptual counseling, we say that the woman should be, should be counseled uh, regarding rubella or uh, rubella uh, disease. So if a woman, a pregnant woman is exposed to rubella disease, measles, there's every tendency that that can cause abortion for that woman. Now, there are other causes that are maternal. And such causes has to do with the local malformation of the genital tract in the woman. 
you know, cervical incompetence, myomas, you know, fibroids. There are also factors. There are also maternal factors. You know, most of the time, if pregnancy is coexisting with the fetus, there is every tendency. Though most of the time, there is every tendency. If the fibroid is very small, that even this fibroid gets strength during pregnancy because the nutrient that the fibroid always gets gets diverted to the to, to the fetus in utero. But if the myoma, if the fibroid is a very big fibroid and pregnancy is coexisting, there's every tendency that the, the, the woman will have abortion. I think you are getting that one right there. The issue, the issue of drug abuse, drug misuse can cause, especially teratogenic uh, drug. If a, if a pregnant woman is exposed to teratogenic drugs, if, if abortion does not occur, there's every tendency that even that baby is malformed that the baby is, uh, is born with congenital abnormalities. Remember your ABO and resource incompatibility. Remember your resource negative and resource positive. I'm sure you know the explanation, the explanation towards that one. If a resource negative, if a resource negative woman is married to a resource negative um, man, regardless of their ABO group, there is a, every tendency, especially during, during um, there's likelihood during pregnancy and greater likelihood during labor for um, placenta, trans, uh, tri, uh, placenta or transfer of the, 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 the resource uh, factor and it causes abortion and uh, it causes abortion and even uh, IUFD, intrauterine fetal death, or even fresh uh, still bats. Well, let me rest on that. And you know, you now think that how will paternal factor, what are the paternal factors that may cause abortion? Yes, there is paternal, uh, paternal factor that may cause ab uh, abortion. If the spermatozoa that the, that the, that fertilize, if the spermatozoa that fertilize, the ovum in that woman is malformed. There is every tendency that that one causes um, abortion. So basically, basically, abortion is classified as spontaneous and induced. Any abortion that is not induced is uh, spontaneous. I hope you are not using that. Any abortion that is not any abortion that is not spontaneous, that no, does not occur on its own, then a factor is interfering for the abortion to take place. So that is the broad classification. Another classification is some people will say early abortion and late abortion. And for early abortion, that is be before 12 weeks of gestation. For late abortion, between 12 and 20 weeks of abortion. That are in school. I'm bringing this one up. I, it's not not to confuse me, to confuse you, but to tell you that there are different authorities that classify abortion. But everything is still within spontaneous and induced. What I'm saying is either late or uh, early. For spontaneous, nothing happens. It happens just like that. For uh, for induced abortion, there is an action that is taken before about that abortion can happen, either late or early. Now, um, now for, uh, let me tell you other forms or other classification of, um, of your abortion. For therapeutic, therapeutic most of the time is always, is always induced abortion because for therapeutic, the pregnancy is terminated the pregnancy is terminated to save the life of the mother. Uh, the pregnancy is terminated to save the life to save the life of the mother. So you can see that that one is it, it falls under induced um, abortion. Now, for threatening abortion, for threatening abortion, the pregnancy is still viable. The abortion has not occurred, but 
there are signs that the abortion may occur spontaneously, that the abortion may occur spontaneously. Well, why are we calling it stressing abortion? One, there is bleeding per vagina. There is bleeding per vagina, though there may not be cervical dilatation. And that is why if treating abortion is not, is not critically looked into, eventually it may lead to spontaneous abortion. But if the, if the cause of that, uh, the cause that is making that pregnancy to be threatened is lifted, the, the, the pregnancy may get to viability and the pregnancy will continue. That is threatened abortion. Now we have threatened abortion that the pregnancy, the, the fetus is still viable, but there is another one that is inevitable. You know, from that phrase, inevitable, you don't have any option. The pregnancy is coming down. Why is it the pregnancy is coming down? There is bleeding per vagina, the membrane has been ruptured, and there is dilatation of the service. And because there is dilatation of the service, the product of conception will come out. I hope you are getting me. And when the product of conception comes out, then that abortion is inevitable. Now, there is another category which is called complete or incomplete. For complete, uh, for complete abortion, either it is induced, either it is spontaneous, either it is inevitable, either, either it is not inevitable. Every product of conception is, expo is, is exp expelled out. Every product of conception is expelled out. That is complete including the membrane, everything is expected. But for incomplete abortion, regardless of the type, there are some product, product of conception that are still in utero, and it is very dangerous. It is very dangerous in the sense that that one may eventually prone the woman to bleeding. Now, there is what is called recurrent abortion there's what is called recurrent abortion and that recurrent abortion is that the woman has had two to three consecutive spontaneous abortion you know when i say consecutively it's just that one two three one after the other not that she has a baby the baby is alive she now has abortion she now has another baby she now has abortion consecutively one two three that is recurrent and what other people call habitual abortion is also a form of abortion. Another thing is mixed, missed abortion. Missed abortion is very funny and very dangerous because with missed abortion, the baby is already dead in utero. The baby is dead in utero. There may not be bleeding per vagina. And the only thing is that signs of pregnancy, signs and symptoms of pregnancy may regress. So the uterus will not be growing again. And that is why it is called missed abortion. And most of the time it's also called blighted ovum. Then another form of abortion is septic abortion. Either spontaneous or induced especially with incomplete abortion, infection may set in. So when infection set in shortly before, I mean, shortly uh, abortion, then it is called septic abortion. It is called septic abortion. And now we have known <clears throat> the signs and symptoms. We have known the types of abortion. Let's quickly move on to the management of a, of a abortion. Let's move on to the management of abortion. And most of the time, when the patient presents, when the patient presents admission, it's very, very important. So when the patient is admitted, when the patient is admitted, 
you take full history. Remember, history taking is important. You do a physical examination. You monitor fetal maternal well being. Very necessary, very compulsory. You monitor fetal maternal well being. The heart rates, quarter hourly, hourly, until stable, you continue to monitor that one. Then you observe sterile technique in everything you are doing so that you will not, you will not introduce infection to the patients. Then another thing is that your reassurance is very, very important. You no know, abortion. The woman is psychologically disturbed, especially with a planned pregnancy. You know, there is this high expectation that the pregnancy would the pregnancy will become a baby that the woman will carry. Now the pregnancy has gone. So there is psychological disturbance. And in that situation, in that situation, the woman will be disturbed. So you need to move close to the woman and you reassure the woman. Then you document, you know, documentation is very, very, is very, very paramount to our care of a nursing. You document everything and you alert a proper authority when there is any deviation from normal. I hope you have gotten me. Now, before we round it up for today, let's quickly discuss, though you may not, you may not get this one on your slides, but let's quickly discuss ectopic gestation. It's still a form of a abnormality of a pregnancy, ectopic um, gestation. And in this one, any pregnancy, any pregnancy that develops outside the uterus is termed ectopic. Any pregnancy that develops outside the uterus is termed ectopic uh, pregnancy. Though most of the time, the commonest sites of um, development is the fallopian tube. The commonest site of development is the fallopian tube. Though very rare, some the pregnancy develop in the ovary, in the abdomen or pelvic cavity. But the, the most commonest um, site is the fallopian tube. Now, what are the factors that may cause this um, uh, development that may make the pregnancy that's supposed to be implanted in the uterus to develop outside the uterus. What are the factors? One of the factors is congenital factor. And with congenital factor, there may be a fallopian tube hypoplasia. There may be congenital diverticular accessory uh, accessory fallopian tube. So anything, any any factor that, he, that, that you remember where the fertilization, the normal fertilization of uh, the zygote and the spermatozoa take place in the fallopian tube, and eventually uh, the, the the fertilized ovum is now moved to the to the uterus. I'm sure you are remember you can remember the development of the fertilization less ovum in your NSC 306, I think. Now, anything that disrupts the movement of the fertilized ovum to the uterus, we, we, we make the pregnancy to develop as a ectopic under congenital factor. Other, other factors are Are the um, factors. And for the acquired, that is um, pelvic inflammatory 
disease. So even prior, prior marriage, prior pregnancy, if a patient, if a woman has either partially treated inflammatory disease or even no treatment of inflammatory disease, it may make the fallopian tube to be narrow. You know, it's a tube, the lumen to be narrowed, and you know when the the, the, the when they um, the fertilized, when the ovum is fertilized, so there will be restriction to the movement of the fertilized ovum to get to the uterus. I think you are getting me. So other factors are prior surgical operation, uh, especially uh, tuba surgery or prior tuba ligation for people who, who use tuba ligation as a means of um, as a means of um, family planning. And that is why you may you tend to hear history that uh, somebody has bilateral tuba ligation as a means of family planning and such individual now come up with a pregnancy, uh, with pregnancy, you know, there can be re recanalization of the tube. I think you, 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 you get me. So prior surgical operation is also a factor to having a topic pregnancy. Others are neoplastic, that is, if there is abnormal growth, to the broad ligament to the or ovarian tube, it can also lead to ectopic um, pregnancy. Now, some other causes, you know, it has been implicated that people who use uh, IUCD, that is intrauterine contraceptive device, that they, they 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 may have ectopic pregnancy. In fact, there are some people that, that, that there are authorities that also say that people who have um, who do uh, artificial uh, artificial reproduction therapy that they may have um, ectopic pregnancy, but with with uh, high, the incidence of having ectopic pregnancy is um, is uh, reduced. Now you know from what I've said, I've been able to able tell you the little pathophysiology of how ectopic pregnancy uh, it developed. Because normally, uh, a fertilized ovum should be implanted from getting to the uterus. We make the pregnancy to be ectopic. What are the signs and symptoms of a uh, ectopic pregnancy? We have anemia, abdominal pain. You know, the patients can have uh, uh, bleeding. And funny thing is that that bleeding may be revealed or concealed. And even the degree of bleeding internally may not be measurable to the bleeding, to the bleeding the woman may have in her vaginum. And that is why shock may set in, the patient may begin to have syncope, and uh, shock may eventually set in. Now, having said that, how is um, ectopic pregnancy diagnosed? Why there is history of missed period? Because if the regular history is removed, then you may miss it. There should be history of that the woman has missed that period and pregnancy is confirmed. So when a woman misses a period and pregnancy is confirmed and, you, and the woman now begins to have all these symptoms, you begin to think of uh, ectopic pregnancy. Now, how is it diagnosed? Though um, pregnancy tests, may even be negative. Why I say maybe it may be negative because especially with ruptured ectopic pregnancy, when ectopic pregnancy is ruptured, the signs and symptoms of a pregnancy will, re will regress. The hormonal level of pregnancy hormone, the blood level of pregnancy hormone will reduce. So if either serum or urine test is done as it points, it may, it, the pregnancy test may be negative and you may miss that diagnosis, but there are other ways to, to diagnose, to make the diagnosis. And though you may have positive pregnancy tests and eventually you can do ultrasound to, to, to ascertain your diagnosis. Even tap, uh, uh, the pelvic can be tapped. I know when there is a, when that tap is done, you would the, the, the tap will yield blood showing that the woman may be bleeding internally. So the management 
of ectopic pregnancy depend on the stage and the condition in which the patient presents in the hospital. Surgery can be done depending, just like I said, depending on the, on the, the, the condition and the stage. Sapingectomy is very common, though conservative surgery are done, especially in, in, in the facilities that have every gadget for that. And what I mean by conservative surgery is that if the, the fallopian tube has not been ruptured and the patient presents earlier, that fallopian tube can still be preserved in a way that the fertilized ovum is expelled by linear sapingotomy, linear sapingotomy and you know the tube can be preserved but if it has been ruptured then um sapingectomy is inevitable for management of acute uh, uh, topic pregnancy hospitalization then you resuscitate the patient you know i told you due to blood loss the patient will be in shock then you treat uh, the patient for shock you know you because of that shock you you like the patient flat with the s uh, the legs raised you give analgesics because the patient will have pain. You give, a, you transfuse when you, you have done your baseline investigation, your blood, full blood count, the PCV, and you are certain that the patient has anemia. So those are the management for acute uh, ectopic pregnancy. But chronic, I call it chronic, is that um, you know there's what is called slow leaking ectopic pregnancy the, the rupture the fallopian tube will not be totally ruptured and the pregnancy is there the patient will be having the patient will be having pains and other signs that i've mentioned earlier so what you do is surgery is the, the definitive treatment for this so sapping jectomy can be done and in some cases Safingo for ectomy can be done. That is, the, uh, the, the fallopian tube plus the ovary can be removed depending on the findings uh, before the, the, the before the, the surgery. Now, by and large, this has brought us to the end of our discussion for NSC four zero two basic maternal and child health volume theorem. And for the purpose of this exam, we have been able to discuss six abnormalities of um, midwifery, especially associated with pregnancy. And I want to tell you that your exam will radiate around these six topics. I'm sure somebody will say that ah, topic is not mentioned. Go to your LMS. The material for the ectopic pregnancy is on it. There is one. Two, get prepared for your exams. Read in between lines. I know the previous book that I had presented had told you that your, your exams will be in different forms. You have CBT exams. That is, you have multiple choice questions. You have the ones that you fill in the gap. You have the ones that you state, you mention, you highlight, you will define, and all that. And you know that this exam will be done online. And also, the exam has been programmed in such a way that the system will mark. So be careful of your spellings because you know, it is what it is it's programmed on the system that the, that the system will take as the answer. Be careful of your system, I mean, of your spellings. So the system will not be marking idea like for the face to face. So, and I want to say, like in Nigeria, we are colonized by the British. So, for NSC 402, we are adopting the British English in our, in our um, exam. I am saying British English because fetus, if you want to spell fetus, for British, it is F O E T A F O E T U S. Why American English is F E T U S. I know we have some 
terms <clears throat> in this um in this course that if care is not taken for face-to-face -face, uh, exam, if you write an American English accepted, if you write British English accepted. So I am saying it now that it is the British English that will be that will be accepted. You know, estrogen for uh, in, for America, estrogen is E S C R O G N. But for British, you have to put your O before it. Gynecology, you know, one has A, one does not have A. So I am emphatically saying this, that you take notes so that you, you will not think you have written correct answer when you have not followed the rule. Once again, before I take questions, I want to say that I wish you all the best in your forthcoming examination. Thank you for listening. Thank you, the uh, facilitator. Please, if you have any question, kindly raise your hands so that we'll be able to pick. So the first person that we allow is the Dan. Once your mic is on mute, kindly ask your question. The facilitator will answer you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful report. Please, your network is not clear. Can you please try to? Hello. Hello. We can hear you, but it's cracking. So the first question is that there are some systems that are already configured to. You were in English, in which if uh, one is typing under examination, uh, under examination like this, that will be also correct. In which uh, one may not notice it, it can there be consideration for that. That's the first question. Then coming back to the uh, lecture, thank you for the wonderful lecture. It's quite explicit, but uh, the first question on that lecture is that is there any scientific rationale or any physiological or physical factor that can uh, be responsible for positioning of placenta during implantation for example maybe sitting position lying position of the woman after fertilization is, is there any of that that is responsible for placenta placement apart from the parity of the mother age and the like? That is the first question. Then second question under the under the lecture, talking about the uh, results uh, the blood uh, of the mother now reaction, that is if you block it, if the Hello? Hello? The, the, the woman calls a great series of authorities in which she has Hello? complained immediately after the video of the video. Hello, am I, am I seeing you, sir? I can't hear you clearly. It's cracking. I can't hear you clearly. I, I know you were asking, you were asking a yeah. question on placenta implantation, the placenta position. What exactly are you talking about? Hello, maybe you can do well. You can do well by writing your question. I can't hear you clearly. Didan, Didan, just try to get a good network. You can try it again or you can type it. You can type your question in the chat room. Thank you. Ania D. Pisayo, your question. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Yes, thank you very much, Master, for the lecture. 
I'll just to ask that um, you were saying something about the surgery that involved ovary and fallopian tube. Please, can you help us come again? The surgery that involved ovary and fallopian tube at the management of having, chronic. That is, okay. All management right, of all right. That is chronic. sapping go of uh, topic pregnancy. Okay. That is sapping go of orectomy. Hello? Sapping. Yes, I'm okay. listening, ma'am. Uh, that is sapping go of orectomy. You get that one, you get that one in your notes. But the issue is that the issue about that one is that you know for ectopic pregnancy, I told you there are different sites where ectopic pregnancy can occur that, but the most common one is the fallopian tube. And most often than not, especially in this part of our world, most of the time the patient will present when the when the ectopic and the fallopian tube has already been ruptured. And in that situation, in that situation, the, the fallopian tube cannot be salvaged again. It cannot be salvaged again. So it shows that the fallopian tube will be re, will be removed. That is sapingectomy. Sapingectomy. But it's now depend it also depends on the, the, the area which that ectopic pregnancy occur on the fallopian tube. If it is very close to the ovary, you know, the ovum is coming from the ovary. I think you are getting me. The ovum is coming from the ovary. And if I, if I'm able to ask you, where is the normal site of implantation for, for normal site of fertilization? If I may ask you that question before I continue. Hello. Hello, my uh, where, where exactly? Where the ampulla, exactly? The ampulla. The ampulla. The ampulla. Okay. You know, normally that ampulla is very wide for for the ovum to be fertilized before the movement to the uterus. Now, if the, the, the ovum is uh, fertilized very close to the ovary and uh, it's now ruptures. The ovary may not be, the, the, the surgeon may not be able to salvage the ovary by, by, by retaining the ovary. So the ovary alongside the, the ovary alongside the fallopian tube may have to be, to be taken away. So that is sapping, the uh, sapping go ophorectomy. That is the surgical removal of the ovary as well as um, of the fallopian tube as well as the ovary. But if it is, if the the, 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 the site of ectopic pregnancy, if it is in, in the other area around the fallopian tube, only the fallopian tube may be removed. That is sapingectomy. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Any other question? So the person that was asking a now, question Odette Ola, Odette Ola, your question. Thanks very much, sir. Can Hello. you please hold that in? Ah, no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm on here. Okay. Okay, ma. ma. when you were talking about causes of hyperemesis, you talked about. Hello, ma. Ah, this boy, please. Hello, ma. Okay. It's so like you're not ready. About... It's like you're not ready. I'm ready, sir. I'm on to you, sir. Hello. When you were talking about. Hello, ma. Can you please continue? Okay. When you were talking about causes of hyperemesis, you you actually mentioned also unsuccessful pregnancy as one of the causes, ma. So I want to know how unsuccessful pregnancy, as a history of unsuccessful pregnancy, I want to know how such can cause a paralysis gravidarium. Then right, secondly, thank you. Ma, I have two questions, ma. Okay, okay, I'm listening. Yes, ma. Then secondly, while talking about uh, labor and um, abortion, rather, while talking about okay. multiple pregnancy, when you were trying to explain to us, ma, you said we should check the uh, the placenta that we are supposed to have three blood vessels, which is normal of placenta. But you know, explain further that if we didn't have these three blood vessels, that means the child may be having a renal disorder. I want you to please help us explain further what uh, the, the relationship between that renal disorder and the shortage in blood, blood vessels that we are having, that is the reduction in the number. All right, is that all? Yes, that's all. Okay, thank you. Your second question, is talking about 
you examine the placenta and the umbilical cord. I hope you are getting me. Hello? Hello? Hello, she's getting you. She's getting you. All right. Me. Now, on, on, in the, on the umbilical cord, you know, we have two arteries, two smaller arteries and one big umbilical vein. If you can remember your anatomy and physiology of the placenta very well. And you know, these uh, arteries, I mean, these two arteries and the vein, they are the connection that make the, they are the connection that, that make um, exchange of nutrients and all that from the mother and the baby, baby possible while still in utero through the placenta. Now, it has been implicated from researches that if, especially uh, umbilical artery, if any, if any of the vessels are missing while you are examining the, the baby and the placenta uh, after the newborn, is if any of the vessels are missing, then the patient, the baby, the newly born baby has to be, has to be, to, to be, to be examined critically. Um, this time around, I'm not talking about the physical examination alone, but to do thorough uh, examination by uh, by uh, doing uh, maybe renal function tests and even the ultrasound, uh, the uh, abdominal, abdominal pelvic ultrasound to be sure the patient, that baby may not be suffering from renal problem. Let me say it again for clarity purpose. You know, one thing is that for a vessel to be missing is abnormal. If you get that one very well, for a vessel to be missing, normal, under normal condition, you should have two umbilical arteries and one big umbilical vein. That is normal thing. So if one is missing, it is not normal. And now from, from researches all over, it has been observed that if one is missing, that, that newly born baby may be having renal issues. So the detailed examination that is now carried out on that baby will now help to know what, is, uh, what exactly the, 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 the baby may be suffering from as far as uh, the renal system is concerned. Then, to your other question as um, touching uh, epidermis, gravidarium, and, um, and um, uh, unsuccessful, previous unsuccessful pregnancy. Well, the, the exact relationship may not be clear. The, you know, these uh, statements are products product of uh, researches. The exact relationship may not be cleared, but what has been observed is that uh, when there is previous unsuccessful pregnancy, there is tendency of a woman having that. But I still want to say, state it clearly too, that these are, will I say assumptions, even if they are very verifiable facts, it does not mean that every woman that has an unsuccessful pregnancy must have hyperemesis gravidarium. But what it means is that if it happens that way, there is a relationship. So I hope you have gotten that. Okay, next person. Uh, Techno P904, your question. Yeah, yeah, your question. Okay. Good afternoon, ma. Good afternoon. Please, my question is uh, I would like to know if there is any physiological process that can result to bilateral tubers pregnancy. If there is what? If there is any physiological process that can result into bilateral tuber pregnancy, 
bilateral tubal pregnancy. Yes, yes I'm, talk, I'm asking a question on that ectopic pregnancy. I, I understand what you are saying. All you right. know, it may be very rare, but it is possible. If, uh, if a woman is having bilateral tubal pregnancies, it, you know there is every tendency that the two ovary releases um, ovum every uh, together in a particular month. And if, if the two of if the two of release ovum and ovum each, and the two ovums are fertilized, and unfortunately the, the, the fertilized ovum are trapped down in the in the fallopian tube, it may be very rare, but it's a possibility. Then the woman can have bilateral to bar pregnancy. I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The The next one is uh, Amber, Amber Day, your question. Amber Day, your question. Okay, sir. Oh. We can hear you, go ahead. I actually typed the question, my battery is done. Okay. Lydia, you only did your question. Thank you. Well done, our lecturer. Please, I just want to ask that where can we categorize blighted ovum in the um, abortion? All right. If I mentioned it. That is me. You can, it's an example of missed abortion. I mentioned it while presenting. Okay. Missed abortion. Because with blighted, with blighted ovum, the patient may not even bleed. Okay. The patient may not, but the signs and symptoms of pregnancy will regress. So it's under misabortion. Thank you. I'll your question. Yeah. Good afternoon, ma. Good afternoon. Yeah, I, yes, I want to ask one of the uh, factor for about your plant center. Can a uh, uh, stress be one of the factors for that? Well, I won't say totally, but how I will link stress. Hello? How yes, I will continue. link stress. How I will link stress to that is that anything that reduces the oxygen, um, the oxygenation to the placenta vis-a-vis -vis the nutrient to placenta. You know, when I was presenting, I mentioned that anything that, that reduces <clears throat> oxy oxygenation to the placenta may cause abruption. So if stress could do that, then it, it, may, it may happen. That is how we can link it. But stress in may not may even be responsible for abortion rather than uh, uh, stress may be responsible for abortion rather than abruption. But anything that reduces the nature of the placenta may account for that. I do you that your question. I do you your question. Ogunla de Roslin. Hello, sir. Ask your question, please. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. I have to ask your question. Ask your question. Hello, Hello ma. Hello, I'm on this. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma. Can you please go straight to your question, please? Yeah, the last topic you treated, the topic uh, gestation. gestation I, yes. Yes, a topic gestation. I didn't get mm -hmm. um, um, the this all the signs and symptoms i got abdominal pain anemia bleeding fever yeah, and your lecture notes and is on the lms okay then your lecture notes is on the lms go and read them. thank you ma you're welcome ogola de rosling Ogunla de Ogunla de Roslin 
Omo le reche. Omo le reche. Salami. Salami, your questions. Salami for Lakemi. Yes. yes, good afternoon, Ma. Can you please speak louder? Good afternoon, Ma. I wanted to ask still on the topic pregnancy. I think I, I have heard something like stomach pregnancy, where the baby is being in the stomach. I want to ask for clarification if there's something like that and if there's any treatment for it. Thank you, Ma. Because that type of pregnancy should be abdominal pregnancy, not stomach pregnancy. But because uh, many, uh, because they are, they are using literary literary um, language, they believe that everything in in the abdomen is stomach. <clears throat> so, as a as a registered nurse, a scientific nurse, we call it abdominal pregnancy. It is possible, but not stomach pregnancy. Is that right? Yes, ma. I Somebody has the for it. The treatment. Definitely, just like the, the treatment for ectopic is also it's where it is implanted. So it can grow. It can. It's it, the patient will begin to have <clears throat> uh, signs and symptoms to to indicate that there is an issue. Definitely, that type of pregnancy cannot grow to term. So the, 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 the pregnancy has to be evacuated. So the treatment is evacuation of the, though some people had said it that miraculously they had uh, abdominal pregnancy to term. But anyway, it is not scientific. It, that one is spiritual or otherwise. But medically, scientifically, pregnancy, abdominal pregnancy may not be able to get to term. Yeah. Yeah, case, I'll follow your question. Good afternoon, Sam. My question is concerning viability of oh, this. Right. Okay. My question is concerning viability age of a fetus. Um, I had previous to now that in foreign in the developed world is 24 weeks that is the viability and less than 500 grams, and in developing countries is 28 weeks and less than one kg. But the facilitator said something different, so I'm confused. Well, concerning the viability, it is right in your <clears throat> it is right in your lecture notes. Go through it. Whatever you have in your lecture notes is what we qualify you to pass the exam. So go and go and check it very well. Okay, ma'am. Sorry, somebody somebody sent a message. Asking about uh, mis abortion and uh, septic abortion. I told you mis abortion. Mis -ab in mis abortion, the patient or the woman may not even have uh, vaginal bleeding, but the, you, the, the the baby will not be viable again. But regression regression in um, signs and symptoms of pregnancy. May, may, may be what the patient will see that will raise the patient's suspicion. You know, the, the patient will have missed a period thinking the pregnancy, will, the pregnancy will progress. So, and somebody asked again, and I told that person it is also what is called blighted ovum. So there may not actually be bleeding. But for septic abortion, septic abortion occurs when septic abortion can occur with every other type of abortion, especially if it is incomplete, except uh, complete. So even with, with complete abortion, septic only means that there is an infection following abortion. Regardless of the type, there is an infection following abortion, shortly following abortion. So somebody asked that question. I think I've answered the question.
ka se nipa Asad, please ask your question. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you, the lecturer. My question has been answered. That's the same thing Okoro asked. I'm grateful. Okay. Adekule, please ask your question. Adekunle, you are wasting our time. Ask your question. Adekunle, Ruff, yes. Go ahead and ask your question. Balogun. Yes, good afternoon, ma. Thank you for the lecture. Please, my question is, somebody typed it and I also wanted that answer about placenta abnormalities. If you can quickly give some examples. Thank you, ma. Okay, thank you. Hello? Hello. Adeni, your love, your question. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, ma. Ma, Why? my question, my question is on a topic pregnancy as regards to the clinical presentation that mm -hmm. there is remiss asymptomatic interruptions. So I want to confirm that is it possible for it to be detected through ultrasound before it ruptures or not, or is there any other means? that the woman at least will recognize to prove that this is an ectopic pregnancy before it ruptures. Thank you, ma. Thank you. Really, he, he, there's every tendency, there's every tendency ectopic pregnancy is detected before it ruptures. But the problem we are having is that we are not getting conversant with ourselves one we don't present early we tend to manage some some uh, symptoms and when our management fails then we present because before it's before it's rupture there is pain and you know the, the patients will be having syncope and all that but you know that patient will they think okay it's because i've not eaten that is why i'm having let me go I'm just, that's why i'm feeling this let me go and eat but with with a uh, slightest symptoms if the patient presents there is every likelihood it does not rupture then presentation is one another thing is that where do that patient present to another thing is that when the patient presents to a particular facility is there any prompt action taken when the patient presents so these are issues that will make the ectopic pregnancy to be ruptured before action is taken. But the issue is that there's every likelihood a patient, you know, in advanced uh, countries, if, if I have my own personal uh, midwife, my own personal doctor, with every slight symptoms I see, I call and with an experienced midwife or a physician, you can begin to think with this, this patient, uh, this woman is telling me this could be the, okay, rush down to the hospital. But you know, we tend to manage ourselves before we present when we can't do it any longer and it will rupture. But it's not as if it was, it is a must that it will get ruptured before we, before we present. Another thing about it also is that even when we present, when it is still, when it is not ruptured, for the procedure stopping jectomy to be done, how many facilities can boldly do it without having complications? So those are the challenges we are having in this side of the world where we see ourselves. Omar, leave your question, please. Amali Richard, your question. Wonderful presentation, ma. Ah, uh, for the sake of clarification, ma, can we boldly say that abortion can be classified into two? That is spontaneous and uh, induced. Why others come under these two headings? Thank you, ma. I can't hear. Are you trying to contribute or you're asking a question? What is your question? Yes, I said abortion basically is either it is either, it is either induced 
um, uh, it is spontaneous, it is spontaneous. So every other one can fall into the two categories. That is what I have said. I don't know if you are, you are asking a question about it or you want to tell me what I've said is right. I just want to confirm. Thank you, ma. So, is there any other thing? Olajima, you can you please ask your question? Good afternoon, ma. Thank you for the very explicit facilitation. Mine is a sort of observation. All right. The knowledge I had during midwifery free until now was that vagina examination is contraindicated in, in, uh, in um, both the previous yes yes so that knowledge I want to... hello hello ma that knowledge is still the same it's contraindicated oh. because it can trigger uh, bleeding the more so oh, okay ma uh, it's yes. just because you didn't make mention of it so no, I, mind, to I will not mention everything thank you ma <laughs> yes ma So, okay. Good afternoon, ma. I need a clarification because of something that I've actually seen in somebody. There was a case of complete abortion, and all pregnancy symptoms disappeared. But the person continued to test positive for a very long time, and even when scans were done, it showed that there was no product of conception in the uterus, but the person remained positive that ACG levels persisted in the bloodstream. So I've, it's, I see this as an opportunity to get a clarification on that. What actually could be responsible for that? Thank you. Okay. Well, it is possible, as in it is possible, it happens like that but the short thing according to your presentation now the short is that the ultrasound did not say the pregnancy is still there but the woman so the woman has to be investigated for that especially hormonal investigation because the normal thing is that with preg with a uh, delivery or abortion the pregnancy symptoms especially the hormonal level should regress that is the normal thing now that it's not uh, it is still high, as you said. The woman, the woman has to be investigated for that. Probably the woman is having hormonal disorder. So the pituitary hormone controlling the whole thing. So the woman should be investigated for that to know where the, pro the problem lies. You can ask your question, Ebele. And after the Ebele, we only entertain two more questions. Thank you. Can you please ask your question? Ramon, okay, allow your question. Okay, ma'am. My question is on Wenike and Kofilopati that you mentioned in Hyperemesis Gravidarum. Your question again, please. Hello. Okay, can you allow your question again? Sir? Hello, ma. I'm listening. I, I can't see. Ask your I, question again. Okay, my question is on um, Wenike and Kefalopathy that you mentioned in Hyperemesis Gravidarum. Okay. I want to know if the administration of thiamine before giving glucose is a measure to prevent the complication or the nurse or the doctor is supposed to watch out for the signs of Wenike and Kefalopathy before administering glucose? Well, you know, one of, okay, one of um, the reasons why, I mean, one of the factors that leads to this hyperemesis gravidarium is, um, is a deficiency of thiamine, that is B1. 
Two, now for uh, the administration, for one to be administered before the other, is to promote the utilization, the utilization of that timing. If it is not done that way, even with the administration of that timing, the the body will not be able to even utilize it, and it will be like it will be like useless. I know if it is administered, if it is administered before, um, if it is administered before administration of glucose, so you are able to know that it would it will the body will be able to make use of it, and uh, the signs and symptoms of hyperemesis gravidarum will it will reduce and it will prevent the Wenekin encephalopathy that I mentioned. I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay, ma'am. Ibrahim, your question. Adida, yo, luwa yemi. Thank you, ma. Um, my question has been answered. I want to ask about the Wernicke encephalopathy, and she has answered me. Okay, last one. Adenike Akeode, your question, please. Adenike, your question. Okay. So the uh, facilitator, Ma, you can round up. We have come to the end of the uh, questions. If you have any other question, you can drop it on the WhatsApp group. Your e tutor and uh, facilitator will answer your question. So, Thank facilitator, you. offer to you. Thank you once again. I want to. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on board for this face-to-face -face facilitation. Just like I had said earlier read your books in between the line and get prepared for the exam i wish you all the best thank you and mr james thanks for anchoring this thank you all